Paddy Power, sponsors of the Road to Cheltenham. Hello everyone, welcome to Road to Cheltenham. We're a little bit chilly. We're at Newbury because Racing TV are still moving house. We're hoping to be back in the studio soon, but in the I meantime... the only one's going to be in Newbury. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's... I mean, it, it is pretty frosty and they've got a very frosty forecast. I think the whole of uh, Britain and Ireland are braced for the weekend. I think it's yeah. going to be pretty chilly, isn't it? Yeah. It's pretty chilly now, isn't it? Shall we, shall we get on with yeah, it? On, yeah, so. uh, We're going to start by talking about the staying and intermediate chasers. I know we've been talking about them lots already in this series, but they're giving us so much to talk about, and they've certainly got you talking, so that is where we're going to start first off. Um, and we're going to talk about the potential impact of a searching Cheltenham Gold Cup. You mentioned this in the first show of the series, and I know that a lot of people have been talking about and wondering whether that has had an impact on the performances of Gallup and Deshaw, who's beaten on seasonal debut in the John Durkin and also on Brave Man's game so far this season. What's your take on that? I need more evidence anyway, definitely for Gallup and Deschamps, whatever about Brave Man's game. Um, Brave Man's game, look, it looks like Haydock was an afterthought as well for him and uh, it didn't work out. Whether it be could jump at the last as he still win, possibly. Gentleman's game might be a better horse than we thought and Gallup and Deschamps, I think he just didn't jump on Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, so is that the effects of a Gold Cup? It depends on what Gallup and Deschamps does next time. Okay. If the real Gallup and Deschamps turns up, it won't be a search and goal cup, that's the issue. We're going to have a, a proper look at each of those races in a moment, but let's remind ourselves what recent winners of the Cheltenham Gold Cup have done. And it's a, a slightly mixed picture, isn't it? Um, there are the last five winners. A Plutar hasn't really recovered his form. Miller, Minella Indo did to a point, but not fully. Album Photo in the last five years, obviously the exception to that. Yeah, but 2019 was a steady run Gold Cup 2020 when he backed it up. He didn't do much after that, but he did win two, so hey, what's wrong with that? Um, and Gallop and the Champ has been beaten in the John Durkin, but time will tell whether he can back it up or not. And if you go five years further back, you can think about Conegree, who was already a fragile horse before he won the Gold Cup. Well, he held his form for a short while, afterwards a couple of seasons but he only ran three times sizing john for a couple of starts but album photo would have been more like sorry a native river would have been more like album photo in that he continued to be a high class yeah. horse for about three seasons yeah afterwards. he did yeah he was he was bang up there I, and i don't know what why how what is the difference i don't know are are we breeding a more fragile racers have bloodlines become narrower and yes. thinner are we breeding a different horse now than we were many years ago and I don't know it's like history I mean the further you get away from Mark the greater people say he was and I think the further we get away from Cardo Star the more magical he's looking. Well, absolutely. Five times a King George winner, twice a Gold Cup winner, and able to be the top-rated chaser, Anglo-Irish chaser, across four seasons. I mean, the more we reflect on that, the greater he becomes. I reflect on him quite a bit, actually. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, he was an incredible horse, but he had the durability. And that's what, to me, is the difference between good horses and great horses. I keep saying it, and I'm only repeating myself. And to me, when you are a Cardo star, when you can do it year after year after year, that's greatness. Time form having the fourth equal best chaser of all time. I um, have him the best chaser of how all time. How many photos of him do you have on your wall? One. Just the one. Where is it? It's in the hall. And what, what is it of? My dad bought it for me. He's jumping somewhere. Uh, Jesus. Good to see you paid attention, Ted. <laughs> Thanks. It's a great, it's a, it's, it's, it's a beautiful picture. That's <laughs> it. And it's the only one hanging on the wall. There's one of him and more than hurricane fly, and there's nothing Pappy on is on the wall. That's about it. Right. Okay. Okay. That's good. They're restrained. I like that. Um, let's have a look at what you're saying about this question on uh, social media. A couple of people have been talking about this. Luca can't have it at all. He just thinks it was an inadequate trip in the John Durkin. And uh, he disdains the X platform for this kind of conversation. But look, at Lydia, I was happy with your grammar. That's I was. That's a big thumbs up for you. Absolutely, the it's and the it's. Spot on. And then we've got Albert Tatlock talking to us from beyond his fictional grave. He saw it as very much a tune-up for Gallop in Deschamps. Jumped indifferently, you can say that again, uh, but got better. Trip far too short for him. 
these days. And characteristically positive mood, Albert is in there. I think Coronation fans would, Coronation Street fans would agree. Um, <laughs> I'm lost. Can we go back to horses now? <laughs> we can. John Durkin, why don't you talk us through that? We're we'll talking to the John Durkin, and it was, as someone pointed out there, an indifferent round of jumping. Now, the top left is the miles per hour loss from takeoff to landing of both Gallop and the Champ and, and Fast or Slow. And you can see the difference. Fast or Slow, this fence loses 2.5. Gallop and the Champ loses 6.7 more, 7.4 miles per hour in the actual jump. And when you start adding those up in a race, they really add up and his jumping was nowhere near even at that fence how fast fast or slow is and the land through the air and away from the fence obviously I appreciate it went along in front he's jumped a bit to his left that left a great gap down his inside all the way for JJ Slevin who's spying it now we get across to the fourth last the field concertina is even your pal Asturian for Lange is right up behind him Lydia <laughs> but a good jump here at the fourth last again fast or slow gets away from Gallop and Deschamps and you talk about jockeys being in control of races JJ Slevin was always in control of where he wanted to be in fast or slow things the third last he switches outside appreciate it going to the second last on the point of the bend but again when appreciate goes left JJ is the one that's able to switch in Gallop and Deschamps you thought here is he going to pick up and is stamina going to kick in is he going to power down the straight but straight away he knew he wasn't Blue Lord got tired it was a first run it was a first run for all of them but he got tired in particular at two and a half but when Patrick went left here JJ spies the gap Patrick switches his whip into his left hand now he puts it back in his right that's because the only way he can run out is to, is to the inside hindsight maybe he should have kept it in his left I don't think he'd have kept him straight anyway he was going very left but that left a great gap for JJ Slevin down his inner Gallop and Deschamps again didn't fly the last Paul switches inside Patrick runs into a bit of a cul-de-sac don't think there's any difference in that he'd have finished third anyway but the winner was the best horse on the day and his jumping was spectacular and for a horse we know stays further a lot to like about it. Uh, really, really so much to like about him. He was able to hold his position there. As you say, he was cat-like in his jumping. But we know from the Punchestown Gold Cup that he stays thoroughly. He's got to be a proper Gold Cup contender, hasn't yeah, he? Yeah, and even if you look back at the ultimate, the ultimate handicap chase. Yes. And you look how far Corey Grambler, fast or slow, and the third horse, John Jones, who is in the Coral Gold Cup, from the last fence, the distance they put between themselves and... Uh, Gordon Elliott's horse to win the Leopardstown chase to Goffer, is it? Yes. Like they put some distance, like they powered up the hill at Cheltenham over 3 1 as well. And so we might be seeing fast or slow in the Savills chase. That's what Martin Brassel was saying afterwards. Is that all right? Brazil, Are you happy with yeah. that, Brassel? Yeah. You happy with Brazil. that? Brassel. <laughs> he's not French. <laughs> no. I'm a, he's I'm from aware. Claire. <laughs> I'm aware of that, and he's an extremely good trainer. He's a very good trainer. Uh, I was lucky enough to ride. Number six, Valverde, nickname, um, and plenty more horses for him. Very, very good trainer. Given the talent, he knows exactly what to do with it. But that is also the beauty, Lydia, of the John Durkin coming back a fortnight. Yes. It opens up a run in the Savills for fast or slow. Oh, I can't guarantee you gallop in the champ will go there. But it does. We are as race cars, you want to see the best horses running. Mm -hmm. And by opening, by moving the John Durkin back, it has opened Christmas for those horses. Yeah, I think it's a really good move. Uh, we can have a look at a direct comparison between Fast or Slow and Galopin de Champ and how they jump. And this is really interesting, I think, because Galopin de Champ and Fast or Slow have almost identical average entry speeds into their fences. But on average, Galopin de Champ lost two miles an hour more. That's just on average. And yet their speed recovery times are quite similar. It just shows how much energy and time Galopin de Champ wasted hanging around in the air. Yeah, yeah and it, that's compared to the horse we saw as a novice chaser where you were thinking, oh my God. Um, I remember his first one in Leperstown taking the side out of your eye. He's definitely not jumping that way at the moment. No. Um, and if you want more information on the race IQ, you can go to at race underscore IQ and have a look at Page Fuller's feed there on X. And also you can have a look at the website for more information. Uh, just to deal with the others in there appreciate it he it's steadily run race very steadily run he didn't look to stay in the turners last season might he be he build up to be a Ryanair type horse this season yeah I think himself and Mighty Potter were in the wrong place in the turners okay. I thought stage star was in the right position in the front end of the field and he, he dictated that turners and was a good winner of it and we saw that in the Paddy Power how good a horse he is but um, I'd say appreciated definitely got back to where we thought he should be at the weekend um, he was a brilliant winner of a supreme we gave him a chance in a champion hurdle he's always worked like a, a proper grade one horse and that was a proper grade one run and I take your point about Blue Lord's seasonal debut but he's won on every seasonal debut for, for Willie Mullins it disappointed me how much he found nil yeah I, I, I know he won at Clonmel Oil last year but 
I've always felt he was more of a two miler than two and a half miler. Okay. Let's that is a debate in close Sutton that is forever raging. Oh, really, is it? Yeah. Okay. How, and you feel like you might have well, pegged one back anymore. there? No. Let's have a look at the chart of the Gold Cup betting and see how uh, bookmakers reacted to it. Galapin de Champ, who was 6-4, to four, is now 3-1 to one with Paddy Power. Jerry Colomb, second in, shortened into fours. Fast or slow, obviously, in at 5-1. to one. Shishkin, 12. Brave Man Games, 14. That is how things have changed. Yeah. Fancy post is your thing. Um, I think they're fair, Lydia. I mean, probably the one I wouldn't back is Shishkin. Says the man who reflexively, having seen the Ryanair graphic in our first show, went, I've got to have 16 to 1 for Ryanair for the Ryanair. There's nothing Air. jumps out at me there. OK, OK. I was right? just, yeah, I was pausing. It's fine. I was just pausing just in case something did. Right, now we're going to talk about a Brave Man's Game. And he was defeated by Royal Pagai in the Betfair chase. Royal Pagai, who is a Haydock specialist. Aplutar is the only horse that's ever managed to beat him there. And he ended up trouncing Brave Man's Game by six and a half lengths. Um, um, you're going to have a look, particularly, first of all, at how Brave Man's Game jumped before we start talking about Royal Pagai himself. And this is a contrast between the Betfair Chase and the Charlie Hall? Yeah, uh, to me, when you watch Brave Man's Game at the weekend, he never looked to be going with the same pizzazz as he did at, at Newbury um, or at Weatherby even in the Charlie Hall. And it's the last three or four strides in. Now, the differences are minimal. There's only a ten tenth of a second or 0 0.17 of a second at, the, at that fence. Again here, it's 0 0.2 of a second, the difference. In, in the envelope, the, two, the three strides in, the three strides out, he definitely wasn't as quick or as sharp a horse last weekend at Haydock as he was at Newbury. Now, Newbury was his first one, you could say that's freshness, but again, when we looked at him in the Gold Cup, he was much quicker jumping in the Gold Cup as well than he was at Haydock. For whatever reason at Haydock, I think he was lacklustre, his run was lacklustre, and even when he made a mistake at the last in Weatherby, he still got himself through the jumping envelope quicker than he did at Haydock in the Betfair Chase. I don't think he's performed. So what, can you put a why, why to that? You've had a look at the figures, can you put a why to that? I would say lethargic, and I would say that the race just came too soon off the Charlie Hall, but that's hindsight. That's living your life in hindsight to say, oh, it came too soon after Weatherby. Paul Nichols wouldn't have ran him if he thought it was coming too soon. But when you watch the race and you reflect on it with hindsight, it probably did come too soon for him. I think Paul Nichols has played out his indecision out loud, though, hasn't he? Because there was the, the aspects of how deep the ground might have been at Haydock. He was thinking back to Clan des Oboe when Clan des Oboe, uh, failed to defend his crown. 2020, was it? Um, and I think, I think so. Um, and he was sort of he was switching between the Charlie Hall and the Betfair Chase. So he went to the Charlie Hall. Then that happened at the final fence. And then he was thinking about the Betfair Chase. I expected him to go straight from the Charlie Hall to the King George and yeah. not stop somewhere in between. So did I. And he, he, he changed his mind. He went to bed. He went to Haydock, and it didn't work out. But no, Paul Nichols. What's he won? Eleven or twelve King Georges. Seems to figure out the way of winning that race. So would you be undeterred about him for the King George? Given I, this difficult you would start? definitely be cautious about him. You would, you know what I mean? You would, in your back of your mind, you're thinking he's had those two runs in this early in the season. They weren't up to the standard he was at last year. But um, I would be waiting for listen to the signals and the vibes from Ditchy. Okay. If Paul is happy, he'd be good and bullish and we'll all know. Let's have a look at what you had to say on uh, social media about this. Beechwood Bloodstock says three miles and good soft ground would see Brave Man's game run to his best again. Well, that's what he got at Haydock because the times were at worst the soft end of good to soft and it was, I know, a little, strong, little longer than three miles but pretty much what he got. Um, but he's wondering whether the Ryanair could be a better option? Possibly, but I get the feeling that Lily doesn't agree with you, Beechwood. Not at this stage. <laughs> Phil Harrison has got something to say as well. He sees it um, differently. Ah, he, he sees it more along your lines, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. But again, that's hindsight. Hindsight's a great thing. And the decision was made to run him. He ran him. It didn't work. Move on. Let's move on. We're going to move on to the 1965 chase. Turn away Seven Barrows team right now. Uh, we'll talk about what happened at the start in a moment. We're first of all going to focus on the winner, though. Pick Dorhey, who in the end had just two rivals to beat, not his main one. No, not his main one, and he got the job done. Obviously, he was a winner of a grade one at entry last season. Uh, Harry Cobden's decision to go to Haydock was absolutely correct, and he, he won the race, and Harry had a great afternoon. Do you see him as a King George horse? 
Uh, no, I don't. Uh, and there's a there's a question mark about whether um, he might even go there. Uh, Savile's Chase was mentioned. It seems more likely that the Ascot Chase and Aintree might be more on their mind, the traditional kind of route. Yeah, that's I suppose similar kind of distances, aren't it? Isn't it mm-hmm. to mid mid distance, two and a half, skipping the Ryanair. Um, yeah, but look, he he had him in the right race last weekend, didn't he? I thought he jumped very scruffily. He has often done that, though, hasn't he? Mm, very That's much just so. picked Dory. Mm. And there was a bit of a fright from Straw Fan Jack, who ran really well. He did know, run up put to scratch, a fight. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Gave him a, some bit of a... a fr- I wouldn't say a fright. I always thought yeah, Pick Dory yeah. was going to win. Yeah, that's, it's probably overstating it to say yeah. fright, but he certainly tried to put it to him. He gave him a race. Obviously, a race. everybody was uh, focusing on the start, though, and what happened with Shishkin. Now, how did you interpret this? This is him... Uh, being taken away to be put on the naughty step afterwards. <laughs> this is how Nico de Boinville felt afterwards. Um, and also he, he gave the debrief to Nicky Henson. Now, it clearly took the Seven Barrows team completely aback, this. Well, I didn't see it coming, did you? No. I know he's been sluggish. He was sluggish at the start of the champion chase. Um, and he has raced lethargically a little bit as he's gotten older, a bit more every time as he's gotten older. But I didn't see him down in tools. I, I thought I didn't see that coming. There was obviously something because one, he was wearing cheek pieces for the first time, and two, they'd sent him away to the Olympian event rider Zara Tyndall's during the summer to get him some dressage into him and get his mood better for training at the start of his training. Yeah, but you can see that in him. Like, I mean, you watched him in the champion chase that Enogamine won. He was never gone in that race. He never went early. The same, he lined up in the Ryanair. He was flat to the boards. Do we have a look at that? Yeah, those? have a look at them. Yeah. You can, and you can see it here. And, and he lines up in a good position. But he's, I wouldn't say reluctant to jump off, but he looks lethargic. He looks slow all the way to the first fence in his champion chase. And he was beaten by the time they got to the fourth fence. Um, and even on landing over the first fence on this occasion, you can see Nico has to squeeze him along. Shishka's not a slow horse. He looks slow there. Same in his Ryanair when he jumps off. Nico has to roust him along early in the race like a horse that doesn't want to travel, that's where I could see the cheap pieces being on him. Mm-hmm. Sharpen him up, make him concentrate, get him to go forward. But that's a horse that won a Supreme who looks flat to the boards in a Ryanair chase. That, that to me didn't make sense. Now we did line up down the inside of the entry after this, over three miles, and it was much easier to watch him. Jumps out against the, against the inside rail and travels beautifully down to the first fence. But I think when you watch those three races, I can see why everyone in Seven Barrows was surprised he planted himself. But um, it's not a good trait, and it's like anything. Horses are clever animals. When they get away with something once, <laughs> there's a fair chance they'll try it again. Yeah, and Nicky Henderson was saying afterwards that, you know, had they had any idea that he might do that, he'd have had an, his assistant trainer or a member of staff down at the start to try and lead this horse in. Unfortunately, due to this, uh, Siskin has now been awarded the time form squiggle. He probably deserves it. He's the highest rated horse in 30 years to get the time form squiggle. Here's the Rose Gallery. Why did Tidal Bay have one? Uh, Why did Kingscliff have one? Well, Tidal Bay was removed later on, I think. Oh, no, 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 it wasn't. No, 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 that was our Vix that was removed later on, and Alberta's run was moved. I should point out that um, I'm joking when I'm calling it a Rogue's Gallery. Uh, the re- reason for a squiggle is unreliable for temperament or other reasons, and so Alberta's run ended up being very, very ground dependent, and that became apparent later on. And Twist Magic obviously had a sulk unless you or Noel Feely was riding it. Yeah, well, Twist Magic could plant himself. Yeah, I could give him a squiggle. I could give definitely Shishkin a squiggle after the weekend. But I'd say the rest of those horses are hard done by. I Challenge you to look. I w- yeah, he was a bit soft. <laughs> But like Kingsliff, he was honest. Yeah. Tidal Bay, I'd love to own horses like that. Yeah, good, them, yeah. I mean, squiggles. I, I absolutely it's love insulting. horses like this. I, I mean, think it's insulting good horses. Uh, shall we have a look at Mad Moose? Everybody wants to see Mad Moose, don't they? Uh, the reason we're going to have a look at reprise Mad Moose's greatest hits here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, look, he, he is tricky. I wrote a couple as well. I, Renetti was one that was quite similar to Mad Moose. Um, but, like, I, I don't think we're quite putting Shishkin in the Mad Moose camp yet, are we? No, probably not. No, that's him refusing to race in the Tingle Creek. Here he is in the plate at Cheltenham on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, stand and start. Always going to be awkward. Tis. Horses the plant need to be moving. Not... No, you're never going to go that there. <laughs> 
six, and, and, and six times he refused st- to yeah, race. Standing starts with horses that plant, absolute nightmare. You have to be on the move. Oh, we haven't, we haven't shown my particular favourite. Well, my absolute favourite is the Aintree one, where he's at the start of the Melling Chase and he d- goes about two steps and then goes, ah, fooled you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, the reason we've shown that, though, is, is because... Ha, you you get inside Nico's head and also Nicky Henderson's and Shishkin's head if you can, oh, yeah. and and try and work out Maybe what they're going to do. You get inside Shishkin's head. <laughs> um, what do you work out to do? It's uh, to me, it's only with a horse that plants himself. You have to keep them on the move. You can't let them get stopped. Always moving, and if you can be moving in a specified direction. Now I, I'm not sure they will figure out with Shishkin what they think will work. Like I would be half tempted at Newcastle to go all the way around to the start. Let's have a look at the map at Newcastle because we were trying to work out because Nicky Henderson was making the point that Ascot Shishkin has to start by running away from the stands, away yeah. from the racecourse stables. Ditto in the King George if you get yeah, there. Yeah, ditto here. But Top if you, right, two mile seven furlong, yeah, ninety-one yards. you go yards. all the way around, if you go out the gate in Newcastle and turn left and canter all the way around to the start, that's the way Shishkin will want to go home. You think so you can fool to Shishkin be, that easily? You'd be surprised. I'm telling you, small things like that can make a big difference, did you? I know Renetti only went one direction. Mm-hmm. If wherever you went on Renetti, if you turned him around, he wouldn't go backwards. So wherever way you were going to the start, you had to go the race and way, but you had to go that you're always going to the start. Once you kept going in one direction, he'd keep going. But if you stopped him to turn him back, get the horse box. OK, so that's what you expected. So top right uh, hand corner is uh, where the rehearsal chase will start on Saturday, provided, of course, the meeting goes ahead. Fingers crossed that it does. Shishkin will be carrying top weight. I think he's a pack. Oh, he's a long way clear. Twenty-one pounds clear, is it something like that? Of Gar of Garlor and most of his yeah. opponents are out out of the handicap. Um, let's see what you think about whether he will consent to take part. It's just the way that he puffed out his chest and had his ears pricked and almost seemed to be he's disdaining. Himself, he? he was, I mean, he seemed to be disdaining the other horses running in the 1965 chase. Right, we asked you, will Shishkin successfully jump off at Newcastle? And you're all, you're all trusting Shishkin, 77%, almost all of you. 23% are the doubters. In Shishkin, we believe. You're the, you're the doubters that need to be silenced this Saturday. Um, we've also got some thoughts from uh, people on Twitter. Sam Beach has got in touch. Sam and Phil, who comes up next, have got entirely different ideas about how Nico should ride Shishkin. What do you think about this? So this is what Sam thinks. Handy, use his pace, give him space, jump, enjoy himself. Does he need more space? I'd be giving him less space. Mm, well. Less chance to whip around, less chance to duck around. Funny you should say that. Funny you should say that, because that's what Phil thinks as well. Here's Phil. And what he has to say. Pick a field, get him in some courses, and I'm sure he'll be fine. But the truth is, none of us know the answer, and Shishkin can't tell us. Phil, this is probably the first time I have ever read anything on social media that actually makes full sense. Ooh, Phil, cherish that. I mean, I've literally never heard that. Ever. Ever. Even when I've sent him something on Twitter. Perhaps especially when I've sent something on Twitter. Definitely not replied that. No. You don't read it anyway. No, no, moving on. No, no. OK, right, OK, so uh, King George betting. Let's have a look at that. And I want to talk about Royal Pagai coming out of it because we haven't given due deference to his Betfair Chase win. Gordon Elliott has been watching all, all of this goings-on last weekend from Ireland and suggested for the first time, I thought... I mean, obviously he's got the entry, that Jerry Colon might come over before he was talking about the Cotswold en route to the Gold Cup. And now suddenly, given what's happened over the weekend, the King George has hoved interview. How about yeah. Alaho? Mike yeah, Alaho Alaho's go? still in. Obviously won the Clonmel Oil and was his attended target last year before his spleen gave out in him. Um, so hopefully that'll be his target this year. Jerry Colon, I hadn't thought of him as a King George horse, but when you look at the opposition and look how they've gotten on this season so far... He'd be sad. I can see why Gordon is thinking the way he's thinking. I think the really interesting one would be Lompressa. I think if he was to turn up, I, I, I know he's, there was a talk of him running in the Tingle Creek, but to me, the run he had in last year's King George, he was going to be a really solid second. If Phoenicia was happy with him, he'd be the most interesting one. Particularly the way that she's going this yeah. season. She's having a, a really good one. I can't see Kempton suiting Jerry Colomb. He's going to have to really smarten up the speed with which he gets away from his fences. I would agree with you. To be at Kempton. Alaho, on the other hand. Made from. Yeah. 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 I think so too. Do you think he might He come started up? shifting a bit left though, didn't he, at Clamel? He uh, did. Having said that, Cotto always went left. He won five of them. Good to star again. 
Um, we sh all goes back to Cotto. <laughs> Talking about Venetia though, we should talk about Royal Pagai because it was a six and a half length trouncing that he gave to Brave Man's Game. Now you've outlined why you think that Brave Man's Game was probably not at the top of his game, but nonetheless, this was an excellent run from Royal Pagai. I thought it was, and it was uh, the pace he showed, how he was able to, he got in the race very early and was able to put the pressure on the other horses. Um, and I, I thought it was a rock solid performance out of Royal Pagai. Jump super, took it off Brave Man's Game, got subsized Brave Man's Game early in the back straight, and you know he made it a real test. And That's exactly. Charlie Deutsch wasn't going to give it easy to Daryl Jacob. Top protector, that was disappointing. Jumped way up in the air from very early on, and ran no race. But you'd have to be delighted with Royal Pagai. Yeah, I think it was a good move from Charlie Deutsch to go on to press it on early in the second circuit because up until that point, I don't think the pace was that strong. It wasn't mad, no. Because obviously. Daryl Jacob didn't really want to step on the gas with Brave Man's Game and it looked like Protectorat wasn't able to. No, I don't think Daryl Jacob was getting the field to step on the gas. Mm -hmm. I from that word go, to me it always looked like Royal Pagai or that Protectorat was going too fast for Brave Man's Game and on the second circuit it was Royal Pagai that was going too fast for Brave Man's Game. Okay. Whereas in the Cheltenham Gold Cup last year and even at Weatherby, Brave Man's Game seemed to be the one that was able to go faster than everybody else. Well, um, Brave Man's Game obviously finished well in front of Royal Pagai in the Gold Cup. Royal Pagai has three times now been beaten double-digit distances in the Gold Cup. Haydock is his manner. I'm not necessarily even sure he had to better his best performances at Haydock because that Peter Marsh win, the second one, was a monster performance. It was. I wonder if he ran national horse. Could be. King George... He inherited second from his unseated stable companion, didn't he, last year? He inherited year? it. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Um, and Protectorat just doesn't seem to be going at all. I mean, that's a, that was a it really was poor, a poor run. He run, seemed to just he had no confidence in his own jumping. No, very unlike him. Uh, from being a wonderful jumper, he was very safe, overly safe. I was going to use a different word, but I choose not to. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, that's what happened over the, the past weekend. All of those assumptions that we make, you know, three odds on favourites, all of them beaten in different ways. And so that's the beauty of horse racing, it isn't is, it? It is, it is. But the game is ruined. <laughs> the great thing is you actually have to, have to run races. They don't award it on figures beforehand. Are those the staying chasers? So last week we gave you a taster of the novice chasers. I asked Ruby to give his idea of what he thinks the clubhouse leaders were at that point in each of the various divisions. We've had some really interesting first timers over fences and a couple of really good graded races as well since then. So it'll be worth recapping in much more detail this time around. We're going to start with Gaelic Warriors. Incredible performance in uh, Punchestown. <laughs> Willie Mullins called it gobsmacking. Yeah, it was, and I think Paul Fernand thought the same. Food of Brazil, was it, that was in front of him? Um, no, Figure Rock was his stable mate that jumped out in front of him. Cool survivors behind him, I know the way you're thinking in the white cap, but Kellogg Warrior was really keen, uh, Lydia, and he pulled Paul Townend to the front after jumping four fences, and when he got to the front, he didn't spit it out there. It was faster he wanted to go. Uh, rounds the bend to the fifth fence, flies that, and when he descended down the hill to the cent fences six and seven, he was just running away with Paul Townend. Now, he was very forward going. This is the fifth fence that he jumped, claps eye in it and really quick and slick. You could argue maybe for an obvious two stick. A fence jumping to his right, we expect that of him. He always goes right. Hit the ninth a fair thump, but he managed to keep himself upright. And again then at the fourth last fence, long and very good. Now he is going right handed. He was drastically right at Cheltenham when he was in front as a juvenile hurdler. But he was still going a little bit right. I liked the way he shortened himself up by the time he got to the last fence and popped it. He had just galloped a mile clear of the opposition and won as he liked. It was a really good performance. I'd say Paul Townend is hoping he'll get a bit more manageable from here on with the fizz <laughs> gone out of him. Uh, absolutely. I think uh, Paul, Paul was very much hoping that. He, what did he say? I said, we, he said, we did what Gaelic Warrior wanted to do. <laughs> that was pretty much it. But look, <laughs> that's not a bad thing with chasers. Yeah. Uh, great chasers jump and go and light jumping and clap on a fence and go faster. Now, he's got entries over Christmas over two mile one at Leopardstown, two mile three at Limerick and three miles at Leopardstown. I, he seemed like he might have been heading towards the long distance race because this is what Billy Mullins had to say to Gary O'Brien after that race. Looking at that, you know, I was trying to aim him for the staying events, but looking at that, we might have to review the situation and see. 
he, he looks more like a two miter or two and a half miter there, you know. So we saw him run into the corner a few times as well, and he did go to his right a, a fair bit at times last season over hurdles yeah. as well. Unfortunately, he barred the festival back here in the spring. A lot of those races, I suppose, that he could be aimed at are the other way around. Does that bother you at all? It does. It's a concern. Yeah, <laughs> it is a concern. However, you know he runs well around Cheltenham and. Um, he can run well left-handed, but uh, I, I would say he, is, he has a preference for going right, yeah. He looks turners to me. I wouldn't see him as a, a Baron of Isery horse anyway, no. um, but it'll be interesting to see where he goes at Christmas. Obviously right-handed at Limerick would look the obvious place to go with him over two miles and three furlongs, but um, yeah, he was a really good performance. OK. Two days earlier, classical dream, finally! made his chase debut. He's pretty slick at Thurnus. Yeah, he is pretty slick. And he, the, the only about Classic Dream is he had a huge amount of schooling done. He was due to run over fences two seasons ago, again last season, and eventually did this season. So he has three years schooling done. Um, but his jumping was spectacular. And Thurlis, I always found it a really good place. When I always jumped around Thurlis, I'd be happy to go anywhere on him. It is a fast enough track. Now the second last is gone out of Thurlis and they've also moved the first and the back straight further on. So maybe not the test it used to be, but this lad was on springs, attacks his jumps. He doesn't, he's a very different to a lot of horses. You'll never see Paul take him back. When you go to short and classical dream, he gets in the air. So you have to trust him. If he wants to get in, he'll get in himself. Or if you spot a long strike, go for it. But he beat Digby in a common canter and he, mm. his jumping was really impressive. Yeah, he, Paul did say afterwards that he liked the way that classical dream was looking for the next fence yeah. and seemed to be measuring it up as they were approaching it. That's the way he does it. But he, he, I, even when we were schooled him, any time Paul went to try and shorten him, I suppose, classical dream would just... So is that a flaw? Because no, you, that's you, just let trust him. You've got to trust right. him. He knows what he's doing. The other th interesting thing about that was, in stark contrast to Gaelic Warrior, he seemed a lot calmer than usual. Because you've said before, famously, famously to me anyway, that this is a horse that's fast in his own head. Is he, <laughs> has he got slower in his own head now? Uh, uh, like age, Lydia. Um, <laughs> he's, you know, starting to mellow. <laughs> When's it going to happen with you? <laughs> It's not. Right, let's have a look at the Florida Pearl, shall we? I saw this lineup. I thought this is a really deep edition of the Grade 2. I really liked the winner, but surely things fell apart behind him. It did fall apart behind him, and obviously the, for the main one, Florian Porter, it was going right-handed. That was his issue. Now, I think Keith Dunahoo makes Florian Porter look easier to ride than he is, and he's going off to his left. Now, we lose Churchstone Warrior at the second, and the loose Churchstone Warrior was a negative, huge negative for Florian Porter. Got upsides him when they got to the fourth fence. And when they got up by the stands in particular, Flory, the loose horse wouldn't go away. Florian Porter started going left, but he's drawn to the left horse. Sandor Kligan dropped in Daffodil Fury there. Florian Porter grabs at that. But the kink that is always in Florian Porter comes out here. When they run down past the parade ring gate, Florian Porter cops the gate and has a little look at it. And Keith is doing his best to keep him, keep him straight. But the more you fight with Florian Porter, the wor more extreme he's jump and get so I think Keith did really well on him but the other horses it didn't go right for Affidale Fury's jumping fell apart um, made a mistake here with Sam Ewing and he never seemed to be happy with him send off Cleegan goes to his right here and catches the wing but at the next fence he heads off left and bangs into Calixius who jumps out in front of Affidale Fury the winner's done everything right, Favre de Sean do. He was right down the inside, he jumped super, he's improved from his run in Galway, but I would agree with you, going for Porter's going the wrong way around, Sendor Cleegan and Affidel Fury didn't rise a gallop and Calixias, I don't know. Yeah, he went out very, very quickly, didn't he? Uh, there's Florian Porter struggling over the final fence and pretty much putting himself Even when he lands, up. like, you want him to run the straight line there, he's heading into the grandstand. He's not having it. He's not no. having it at all. So the favourite, sorry, the winner, Favre de Chandou, is now favourite in some books for the, for the National Hunt chase. And I can see that. I thought he jumped really well. He's going to stay really well. He's got to prove himself outside of deep ground. He's got to prove himself at the festival because he got a bit in a bit of a tiz prior to the Albert Bartlett last yeah, year. Yeah, and like, he'd probably go three miles of Christmas in the Nevilles. It would look the ideal race for him. Um, and there's lots of races. It's, like, he's a good staying chaser, Fabri de Chandu. I quite like his stable companion, Salvador Ziggy, for that race, the National Hunt Chase. Was he runner up? Is it uh, Kerry, Kerry National? National second, yeah. 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 Off 150. It has the experience. Second yeah. in Could the do. attempts last season. The, Got the right kind of profile. He did, yeah. I wouldn't be overly keen on his run of Far Hill, though. Right. Surely he can recover from that. He's got time. Yeah, he did, but watch that. OK, all right. I haven't watched that, as you've rightly divined. I will now watch it. I knew you hadn't. You're putting him up. <laughs> I haven't put him up. No, you were just mentioning him. 
Affidel Fury, now Sam Ewing was looking down several times. He clearly felt the horse wasn't moving right. And I, he said he'd hang right, jump right. The vet couldn't find anything, but Sam was clearly not happy with him. Yeah, and often as a jockey, you look down. Now, what you're going to see, I couldn't tell you. Um, even I yeah. admit that. So yeah, I often you know, do you, wonder, you, you, you're not going to see it. What you're trying to do is tell people in the stand. I imagine not going that well. So you start looking down, but you're not going to see it. Like, um, so that's what it was a sign that he was never going. He was never happy. Now, some people have questioned Gavin Cromwell even running Flooring Porter at Punchestown because of this, the last time we saw him there, which was in the 2021 Champion Stayers Hurdle. Now, he caused trouble at the start, which he often does, but he also caused some more trouble. He did, yeah, and he was, he was quite free and ranked that day, but unfair to Gavin, and he said it on television before the race, after watching him at Cheltenham in October, he felt that they had to give him another try, mm -hmm. going right-handed. He mm -hmm. did look far more manageable at Cheltenham in October than he has ever done in his career. So I can see why Gavin Cromwell went back right-handed with him. It didn't work. I don't think he'll go back right-handed with him again. No. But if you don't try, you never know. Yeah, I, I, I get that. He's been kept left-handed for the last, I think, 10 starts. Um, and I doubt we're going to see him right-handed again. Are, are, are we right to judge him on his performance at Cheltenham, which has been franked since? Or do we have a little bit of a concern in our minds because of just how um, awkward he is, not, not just I, the right-handedness? I think going left, he's fine. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, would, I wouldn't be opposing him any on a left-handed track yet. OK. Right, as I mentioned, there was another grade two that was also won by Gordon Elliott with Imagine. This was the Craddock's turn. And this is the race that Ruby is going to analyse. So this week for Analyze This, I'm going to look at Jack Kennedy uh, on Imagine at Punchestown last weekend. I think it was a magnificent piece of riding. So they set off Uncle Phil's in front, Imagine in the red colours. In behind him is Lucid Dream in the white cap under Liam Quinlan. Uncle Phil is a front runner, keen going forward. Hosh Michael O'Sullivan rode him and Jack follows him early in the race. Now there's nothing untoward about this part of the race, but if you spot the gap between Jack in the red and Michael O'Sullivan in the yellow, Jack Kennedy always leaves that gap there for Liam Quinlan, who's in the pocket behind him and he encourages Liam to keep looking into that gap. He has him inside him, directly behind Michael O'Sullivan but he's always making Liam think that there's room for him to get out. So he's staying outside Michael O'Sullivan, he moves up here to push Uncle Phil forward but again on the point of the bend he drifts off and leaves a gap for Liam Quinlan to ride into and lose the dream as they head down to the second last fence. But when Liam goes to go there, in comes Jack, obviously gives Michael O'Sullivan a shout and sends him back in. Now he has Liam in the pocket commits to go by Lucid Dream or go by Uncle Phil. Lucid Dream has to go back and around full throttle to the last fence and he's going to win by half a length. To me that's the brilliance of race riding. You're not just riding your own horse, you're riding all the horses around you. I felt it when I rode against Jack Kennedy when he was a young man. He knew exactly what he was at. The more I watch him now as a rider and the run he's on, he has everything. <laughs> So, Jack, he taketh, but he also giveth, do you not? You were ribbing him earlier in the in the series, and this is um, a... Oh, yeah, but that's, what you, that's, I mean, that's the standard I expect Jack Kennedy to write. I know, that's what I, I think know. he's able to, able to do. Uh, interestingly, Gordon Elliott felt that he... This, imagine, is a stayer, and he was talking about coming over for the Corto Star, the old Feltham. Um, yeah, he mentioned that when he was thinking about bringing Jerry for the... Mm. Jerry Kalam for the... King George. King George. So, yeah, that'd be interesting, yeah. OK. What do you, how do you rate Imagine? Hard to know. Uncle Phil, Lucid Dreams, they are in the 130s max. Yeah. So he, he will he need to... He needs to be a better horse yeah, there. Need, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, OK, let's have a look at Mr Policeman. This is another one of the Willie Mullins massive, a horse that was in the Morgiana until a late stage, and this was his chase debut. Yeah, and it wouldn't have blown anybody away either. Uh, Rumour also booked out in front. The green cap was uh, Food of Brazil. Mr. Policeman got a lovely lead in behind him and a lovely gap on his inside all the way to jump into as well. But um, it didn't blow you away, Mr. Policeman. When they got around to the second last fence, in behind them was Pinkerton of No Meads in the black with the red cap too. The Mr. Policeman lands a bit static at the second last and Food of Brazil has gone on him. I thought watching this race live, Food of Brazil was home and hose, especially mm. with that jump at the last fence. But to be fair to Mr. Policeman, he digs in and gets up late on to win. It 
didn't blow me away, Lydia. I think he has to, like a magic has to improve. I think this horse has to improve even more. Yeah, I agree. I think he was too careful if he's going to be a two-miler. The one thing that Paul Tannen did say was that he was impressed that he just needed a very light flick of the whip to go and win his race from a disadvantageous position from the last. I know he's a horse that Willie Mullins really likes, but he'll have to start doing more on the track, I think. Right, back to Britain and let's head to a graduation chase that also featured a Willie Mullins runner. That was Gayard de Maynil, who's been placed in two different nationals. He was giving away a lump of weight to less experienced horses and he was beaten by Grey Dawning. Apple Away was also making her chase debut. Yeah, and early in the race at Haydock, you could see the difference. Like Gayard de Maynil in the middle, he definitely jumped like the experienced horse. Apple Away went with him early, but Grey Dawning did look like the novice behind him. Um, jumped, got in tight there to that fence, and whereas Gayard de it was more professional but as the race went on Grey Dawning warmed up to the task with the experience and eventually by the time we got to the last fence in the first circuit jumped by Gaillard de and was in complete control of this race then Appleway was quite careful at this one didn't help her chance and she's run a really good race but Grey Dawning with that runner at Exeter under his belt where Stay Away Faye Stay Away Faye beat him um, had a bit of a grab there that's just the novice in him but down the home straight he was really good um, pings the fourth last race is all over I thought he was very good again at the last fence and he's run out a really good winner um, improved some of the skeleton horses have been a bit in, a bit in and out but this is one that improved immensely for his run at Exeter and I think that was a good performance I think this is their thousandth winner together for Harry and Dan Skelton some goal yeah. isn't it yeah very much so huge I figure love the way he accelerated into the straight and just killed the race stone dead Cut quarter star for him potentially yeah, it would look the right place to go with him, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, Paul, what's Paul? Paul Lappers Hill, maybe? Yes. I think Stay Away Faye, to me, again, a bit like Jerry Callum. Doesn't scream Kempton to you, but mm -hmm. I don't think Seymour Business screamed Kempton to many people and he won a King, couple of King Charles's. True that. And Apple Away, she shaped okay. I mean, she's shaped like a thorough stayer, which we know she is from the second yeah, last season. Yeah, exactly. And she's, um, in fairness to Lucinda Russell's horses, they do progress with every run none more so than Corey Grambler who we didn't mention earlier he improved two stone from Kelso to Haydock and he can improve a huge amount as well really good point actually yeah. he ran really well in the in the Betfair chase and we shouldn't uh, overlook him um, he, he did really nicely yeah yeah a big improvement, as you said. Right now, not all novice chases were exciting as the ones as exciting as the ones we just showed you. Some of them looked like this. Uh, Mai Tai uh, had a half match at Exeter. Uh, Bull Bali, sadly, his saddle slipped and he pulled up mid race. Yeah, it's a funny one, isn't it? When you can't remount, I often think when you're the only one left, should you just be awarded the race there and then? Mm -hmm. You think about it like so when he pulls up now my eye has to keep going and jump all the rest of the fences which is great but when you can't get back on the horse anymore i often wonder is that the way it should then when you're the only one left should you just pull up and be awarded the rest so many implications that i haven't thought about at this stage but i can see why you might say that from safety from a safety perspective certainly i had once had to go around on my own at taunt and run the two runner race and the other one fell early it was the longest two miles <laughs> <laughs> my ties jumping uh, was in, indifferent at times, I thought. It was indifferent, but again, when it's uncompetitive like that, very hard to judge it. OK. Hence, well, we haven't even looked at it. At least he had half a rival. Uh, this is what Pembroke had to do in order to win a novice chase at Warwick. He just had to walk past the judge turn up because, unfortunately, Matata had got a res mis respiratory infection. It was meant to be a thrilling match, but instead we had a, a horse walking over instead. What's the problem here, do you think, Ruby, with uh, our small field sizes? Look, Lydia, we're wondering what's the problem with horses not being able to back up gold cups. You wonder, it looks to me to be supply. You wonder, there's still a huge amount of foals, but there doesn't appear to be the same number of horses coming through the system to the track. Now, I don't know where the answer is in that, but I think it's something that has to be looked into. Um, are they sorted at an earlier stage in the point in point to pointing before some of the, I, I think it's a multifaceted problem. Yeah, but myself. even and I would agree that point to pointing has definitely created a funnel, and it's easier for in big, Ireland, in Ireland is, for right. bigger owners to pick the better horses. But when you look at numbers of hunter chases or of hunter certs even those numbers aren't going up enough either. Mm -hmm. So um, I just don't think it's as simple as that. And also, are we actually even breeding the right horses? Because if you look at the flats, horses that um, might have headed towards jumping, they're, they're being bred in fewer and fewer numbers as more 
people tend towards horses up to the distance of a mile rather yeah, than the horses that would be able to stay. Definitely not my speciality. I'm not going to start giving a hugely strong opinion on it, but when you do look at our, our bloodlines and how narrow they've become, you do wonder what's going on. I think this is a really urgent problem. Um, I think it's a third existential problem on top of the whole global welfare debate, affordability checks, and, and of course, in Ireland, the, the governmental law about, yeah. about advertising. Yeah. Um, I think this is a third one, the supply chain of horses to maintain A, jump racing, and B, flat racing over the full range of distances at the highest grade I, in Britain I, I think that is, Ireland. It is, it is a huge issue, and look, if people give out about the top trainers, they're dominating it. I don't. I think that's a very simplistic. Has an impact. Has an impact, but it's too simplistic. I think you have to go back to the why, rather than just looking at the at the end product. The sport is the end of a huge industry, and you have to go back and look at how the industry is is performing. I think, and I don't think it's performing up to scratch at the moment. And I know that Horse Racing Ireland are taking this very seriously and are already taking steps to try and, and do something about it and get a strategy. I hope that Britain follows suit in that because yeah. I think it is very much needed. There is, but it's not going to be something easy to solve. No, it's not. I don't think either of us are pretending so. Right, let's go back to the racing. Uh, we had a listed Mayor's Novices Chase at Exeter. It was rescheduled from Bangor. It produced quite a deep field. It was won by a four-year-old. Yeah, and she jumped well too and it was a competitive race. Competitive race from jump from flagfall. Arclight booked out on the outside, Nicky of the Bumble in the red cap. But you can see how competitive it is to the first fence. North Susan on the very outside and Gallic Gallic Marcala down the inside. Look, plenty of pace onto the first race. Deep field, as you said. North Susan's jumping was a bit in and out. She's wide on the track under Harry Skelton. A bit high, maybe, that fence away from the stands. And then when they climb up out of the back straight, Arclight, good jump at the second last, just about, and kept going well to win from there on. Yeah, I quite like the run of Carol's Pass for going up and trip for future reference. Nurse Susan was probably a bit keen returning from a 613 day absence. Lady Odair looked like she'd maybe returned too quickly after a second to Nappers Hill at, at Wincanton. Yeah, yeah, possibly, but um, I think when you look through the overall ratings of the race, Art Light was the one that jumped out to me, being a four year old open to the most improvement. Um, and some of the others are going to have to improve to compete at graded level. Mm. In case anyone was doubting that we're at Newbury, regular viewers will have recognised the sound of the trolleys going past and will know that we... Would we lie to you? We're at Newbury, and even on a Thursday, they have trolleys. Maybe they have trolleys here every day. Maybe when there's no one around, they just have trolleys as well. I don't, I don't know. I'm learning more about Newbury all the time. We end with Hacker de Tarbot uh, winning at Cork in a beginner's chase. You know I really liked her last season. I think she's going to be a fabulous chaser. I think so too. She's a strong staying mare. And a bit like the race in Exeter, Lydia, this was competitive early. Uh, they had a tar about, they jumped out and they went a really strong gallop, especially for a beginner's chase in Ireland. Fedans was on her outside. They hurtled down to the first fence. But I loved the way Hacka de Tarbart jumped. Uh, really good at the first fence under Jordan Gainford. And yeah, as you said, she was a decent novice last year. Fedans was outside her second fence then when she's in front on her own. She's, she shortens up and jumps at Fedans, jumps back up on her inside. Night and day was William Mullins representative. She made a mistake at the sixth fence. Danny Mullins was wide on the track on her. And she, well, she briefly looked like challenging at the fourth last. This jump really put her under pressure. Yeah. That's what Heike de Tarbart has. And you looked at mares last year that caught your eye jumping, Dino Blue and Impervious. Cork has a couple of mares chases, that's where you tend to see them. This mare, this was over 2-5, but I thought there's a lot to like about this filly. She looked like a stayer last year, and she's, I think, won a quite a deep race, and she's going to go a long way over fences. She's won it readily as well. She was third in the Jack de Bromhead Mares Novices Hurdle at the festival last season. She's presumably going to be headed towards the Mrs. Paddy Pal Libertine Chase, and I really really like her yeah she's a good like her a lot yeah <laughs> and that's a, a, obviously we're talking about novices running in open races but that seems to be a race novices are well able to compete in yeah yeah and we've seen that season after season now we've got uh, at least two significant races for novice chasers this weekend there are a couple of graded ones the first of them hopefully will be at Newbury tomorrow the John Frankham novices chase where we hope to see Hermes Elan making his chase debut. He's up against some horses that have already shown pretty proficient form yeah. over the fences, Nickelback and Marble Sands. And I was listening to Paul Nichols last night 
I think Carmes Allen was here galloping at some point last week, was it? And he was at pains to say how much he thinks he'd improve for the run, Carmes Allen. Obviously a decent hurdler, won last year's shallow. Um, and he is the class horse. He is the class horse. But you're looking at novice chases. Then I heard Paul talking about, was it Goldstone? Yes. The second to Rocco at Warwick. Yes. Uh, only the two starts of offences. Really likes him. But he's in handicap. You wonder why you have no runners in novice chases. Welcome to Britain. <laughs> Welcome to Britain. Um, uh, I should mention Oroko, actually, who unfortunately, he was really excited, uh, won on his uh, chase debut, um, and unfortunately is out for the season with a leg injury. He looked like he might be quite decent. It's a real shame for Josh Guillermo and um, Ollie Greenall. Uh, we've also got the Drinmore on Sunday. This is at Fairy House. Let's be clear about it. Who beat um, Tom, what's his name? The, the horse that... Uh, was well beaten at, at Cheltenham. I can't think of his I think of his name. Anyway, let's be clear about about it. Laughed at him. Um, I think it was a Cork Grade Three last time. He's the five to four favourite. Found a fifty. You were talking about last King week. King Collins is ours. Yes, that's that's the one. Absolutely. And Sharjah, <laughs> and Sharjah who's already uh, shown himself done efficient. absolutely nothing wrong. At Mighty Tom. Thank you, Sarah, our producer in earlier. <laughs> uh, but Sharjah's done absolutely nothing wrong with offences. I am Maximus last year's Grand National winner, American Mike beat. Uh, Fact the file at Navin. I really like found a fifty. Right. Highlighted to you last week at Down Royal. You did. Uh, I think he's a really good horse. I think that's going to be a proper race with. Um, let's usually, be clear about it, it against it. Usually is, and in fairness, the Hatton's Grace and the Drinmore uh, can be outstanding. Outstanding. They're usually outstanding races. The Royal Bond can have indifferent renewals. Last year's was obviously very good. Marine National and Irish Point beating Champ Kiley, but it can be up and down. OK, well, all of those races we'll be looking at next week. We're going to end by talking about the hurdlers. You have to respect Nicky's record in the race, really, you know? But the way things are going, you'd have to fancy an Irish. Yeah, same with the Hennessy. I mean, yeah, but it's not cold. Ah, it's a Hennessy to me. Always will be. It's kind of the way I am, you know, a bit old school. You know, don't want to give in. Right, well... Yeah, the Hennessy. Great race. But uh, you lads fancy anyone for the Whitbread? The Whitbread. The race that isn't until April. It hasn't been called that for over 20 years. That's the one. The old Whitbread. I still call it that as well. The old Whitbread. One, of course, by uh, Desert Orchid. Old Desi. Desi, I called him. Really big grey. Just popping from fence to fence. Sight for sore eyes. In the glory days. Glory days of racing. <laughs> So the two milers have got rolling with the Morgiana. It was just four runners and it was won by State Man, which meant it was his sixth straight grade one success in Ireland. His second Morgiana, the only horse that's ever beaten him when he's completed over hurdles, is the mighty Constitution Hill in the champion hurdle. This Morgiana was very straightforward for him. It was very straightforward for him, for him even. Field Dudari jumped out in front. Paul let Sam Ewing off a nice distance in front of him. Pied Piper followed him. Echoes and Range dropped in last. Field Dudari wasn't brilliant at the first, but Stateman was better than he was last year, not as high. Um, and Paul actually said that afterwards. I thought he jumped reasonably well. Echoes and Rain jumped exceptional. She was the one that was really quick through the air and catching up with her rivals. Pipe Piper misses this hurdle early in the back straight. Um, a statement Jin that kind of jumps into him and Jack Kennedy you can see is in the pocket inside Paul Townham and they jumped the fourth last hurdle. Danny Mullins is following him. Up to the second last then Field of Dari is going the fast as he can. Stateman jumps it well. Paul sits just back off him. Jack Kennedy goes into the pocket. Gets a beautiful run through on the inside here as they round the bend inside. He's stable mate. Field of Dari. Echoes Rain is outside but the run didn't matter. It was no sooner was Pied Piper in there and Stateman was gone forward by over and the race was put to bed. I love the way Stateman quickened. Uh, down the straight I think he was more impressive to my eye this year than he was last year pinged the last hurdle and I loved the way he looked like he was quickening all the way to the line yeah it was, it's an eye thing really is it more than a time thing this and, and the fact that he's come back clearly at least as good as he was last season and you would expect him to be able to dominate the Irish scene this season he would. Uh, obviously, he'll have new rivals. Irish Point and Imperial Pass will take each other on Sunday. Uh, we think, well, they're both in the race anyway. And Tihoop, who's in there as well, he looks more of a stare, but he's in the same ownership as Irish Point. So we'll see what the decks are tomorrow morning. But um, yeah, the, maybe one of, one of those could jump forward. We'll talk about that 
in a moment. We'll also focus a little bit more carefully on what Paul Tannen thinks about State Man. But first of all, we need to talk about the incident that the stewards looked into, into this race. Sam Ewing, who was on board Feast Dari, ended up with a five-day ban for making a manoeuvre with the apparent attention intention of advantaging another runner trained by the same trainer. And this is the Irish Horse Racing uh, Regulatory Board's Rule 226. You're going to talk about this, Ruby, and we're going to have a look at the overhead shots. Yeah, look, 226, it is a rules, a rules, a rules, a rules. Sam Ewing in front heads to the home turn, drifts out to Paul Townend in the yellow, and Jack Kennedy slips through on his inside. Now, Paul feels Sam coming out, goes to push Sam back in. It does get tight for Jack Kennedy for a second on the inside, but Paul gets by Sam Ewing and gets over to make it as hard as he can for Jack Kennedy. That's to me is race fighting that's happened since Adam was a boy and or since racing began even and I think look the rule is there and if the IHRB are going to implement the rule that is their prerogative they're entitled to but I have never remembered this rule being enforced it or used. It hasn't been. So I checked into it. Uh, it was introduced in 2019 as part of the European-wide harmonisation of the rules. It's the first time that everybody thinks that it has been invoked. There was no published guidance as to the parameters of the potential penalties. So, you know, we, we wouldn't know what, know what to expect. Five days is what Sam Ewing has got. Gordon Elliott was not asked to give evidence, and there is provision within this rule uh, to find the trainer in breach, potentially certainly to ask them questions although it's primarily uh, considered a riding offence. Um, and as I understand it, Sam Ewing is likely to appeal. I suppose the pertinent question is, why did Sam Ewing come off, come off the rail? He said he drifted. I'd say, I don't know, and I didn't ask Sam. To me, someone that I expect, I think Sam Ewing is a brilliant rider, I would expect him to follow the rail. Now, personally... When I was riding, I didn't trust anybody else to follow the rail, so I made them follow the rail. I'd have been up closer if I was Paul Townend, making sure Sam Ewing turned the bend. Um, but it, look, the stewards have found him guilty of drifting off the rail to allow Jack Kennedy come through. Do I think it's a five-day penalty? Absolutely not. Why not? Because it had no bearing on the result. But to me, it's up to the riders within the race to stop that happening. Um, the other riders even to stop not allow it to happen is that is the way I would have, I would view it or see it and and I think when a rule has never been used before a warning like would a day to Sam Ewing to say lads this rule is here and ladies this rule is here and we're going to use it beware no I think, warning I think, that's, I think that's a fair point um, the other um, thing to mention is that Sam Ewing didn't mention at scales when he came in that the horse had drifted off the rail but he did use it in evidence in the stewards inquiry so he'd have been in a stronger position had he mentioned it to the scales before the inquiry began so if Sam Ewing had told the clerk of the scales that his horse drifted he then could have used that evidence in the inquiry I think he'd have been in a stronger position that would certainly be my, my reading of stewards inquiries over time so, oh jeez, I know I can't. Have would that you one. appeal? I definitely would appeal. Okay, right. Well, I wouldn't we have done in the first place. I'd have drifted out going to the second last. We shall see what happens. Paul Townend. Now he maintains that Stateman was not his true self in the Champion Hurdle. This is what he had to say to Gary after Stateman won the Morgiana. We are just looking for excuses, and uh, because I, I like him so much, but he. Um, I just threw out the race at Cheltenham. I, 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 I thought I'd be going better at stages and, and I wasn't for whatever reason. So, yeah, we won't give up on him, yeah. Well, that's interesting to bear in mind. We do see Constitution Hill hopefully reappearing at Newcastle on Saturday in the Fighting Fifth. These are the horses that he's up against. A couple of notable mares, Le Venvoy, who was an excellent second to Honeysuckle in the mares hurdle at Cheltenham. And you wear it well, he's already returned with a good listed win at Weatherby. Yeah, she did, um, and it was a good performance, but look, the price is reflective of what chance... Well, he's Constitution Hill. He's a rocket. Then, of course, we've also got the Hatton's Grace, where horses that have different distance requirements meet, and everyone's going to be very excited about the return of Ampere Pass, uh, the winner of the Ballymore last season and potentially the biggest threat to Constitution Hill. Last year's winner, Jehupu, is there, who was third in the Stayers Hurdle and beat Honeysuckle in this race last year. He did, and Classical Dream. Um, and it'll be another belter. I think Irish Point is the horse that's... I don't know if they're both run, obviously. They're both uh, Rob Corr, run the colours of Rob Corr, but I thought Tuhupu was, look, 
I think we were all surprised this day when Honeysuckle uh, met with defeat, but Tihupu backed it up with a couple of performances after that. He's a very, very good horse, and uh, he's probably, the, I think, the one to beat in the stairs, to tell, you, to tell you the truth. Okay. Uh, we had uh, Blue King Doro winning at Ascot. Briefly, your thoughts about him? He could potentially step up to the stairs hurdle? Yeah, he could. He um, has a bit to go, but he could get there. He's going the right direction, anyway. We've also, we've also already had a, the Liss Mullen hurdle, which happily saw Bob Allinger back in the winner's enclosure, beating Zanna here with home by the league, quite well beaten on this yeah, occasion. Yeah, quite well beaten. It was a tactical enough affair, but it was good to see Bob Allinger getting his head back in front. And I love the way he battled from the last. Zanna here looked down to the last like he was going to bolt in Bob Allinger, but Zanna here pinged it and Bob Allinger had to battle back to win. OK, let's have a look at the long distance hurdle. Uh, declarations. We're hoping to see this at Newbury tomorrow. Paisley Park and Dashiell Drasher, but most importantly, perhaps Marie's Rock as well at the top of the market, trying three miles for the second time. I think she's going to be really exciting in this division. Yes, yeah, she could be. Um, she didn't. She has to. She did say it, ain't she? She just ran into Sarah de Burley, who was in incredible form. OK. Well, we'll have a thorough look at the staying hurdles next week, along with everything else this weekend, provided racing is on. Thanks for your thoughts, Ruby. Thanks for watching us. We'll see you soon. Paddy Power. Sponsors of The Road to Cheltenham. Watch live racing now on RacingTV.com. <laughs>